Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 16th of March 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on board. And uh, we've got a good number on already. I've got Tanya Lacantro teed and ready to come on in just a moment. Just two things I want to do first. Firstly, I always have to just play this slide to remind you this isn't financial advice. Um, this is just general chat. Uh, we don't know your particular circumstances, so don't take it as advice. Um, you know, you need to do more specific research or talk to a financial advisor if you have specific financial needs. Secondly, please do play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. Uh, we do moderate the stream. This is as at the 16th of March 2021. And uh, use at Walk the World if you want to get my attention, specifically if you want to ask a question. I've also enabled the super chat, which means two things. One is you can basically make sure your question gets to the top of the list. And secondly, if you want to support us in what we do, uh, you can also use the Super Chat to do that as well. Uh, any contribution greatly received. Um, we don't make a lot of uh, money out of doing what we do, but this is more about uh, sharing um, thoughts and ideas and uh, helping to lift people's education levels and understanding levels with regard to the finance sector. And just before I bring Tony in, I've got some very important news. You may know that uh, responsible lending has been bubbling along. And in fact, the... Senate was due to vote on it Monday. Well, they didn't. And they were now meant to vote on it on Thursday, but they won't because the Senate has decided that it will be postponed until May. The reason it's going to be postponed until May is because they don't have the numbers in the Senate. In other words, all the crossbench and Labour are voting against the repeal of the responsible lending bills. If you want more information about that, we did a post the other day titled Labour Crossbenches Stop This Lending Disaster. And the good news is that uh, it's been stopped in its tracks at the moment. Not sure what that means longer term, but certainly when it comes back in May, we'll be lobbying again. I think it shows the power of people. And uh, thanks to all those who made submissions and uh, you know basically lifted this issue up from being rather hidden to something which is um, uh, very much to the fore and in fact uh, my Twitter feed has been quite busy today with people debating this particular issue so there you go. So that's some um, some really good news and it shows again that uh, we can have an effect um, in terms of uh, the way legislation's um, shaped up. Of course ahead Australia Post is another one but that's another, another day we'll talk about that. Anyway let me now bring Tony Lacantro in. Tony are you there? Good evening, Martin, and good evening to the loyal viewers of this most beneficial program. This, you know, this is where it's at financially. We're not the mainstream, but we know what's going on, and we're forecasting the future, as ugly as that is. But, uh, no, happy to be in Perth. Well, Tony, it's great to have you on once again, and uh, I can uh, honestly say that uh, you're one of the favoured guests uh, on the show you know people always want to come and listen to what you have to say uh, partly because of course you, you are intrinsically unpredictable which is good but you also have a very clear perspective in terms of some of the really important things that are going on at the moment and uh, I look forward to sharing uh, some of those uh, thoughts uh, as we as we go forward um, I guess um, as normal you know I know you have a few slides that you'd like to walk through but before we get to that just what's your sort of top level take? You know, if you go back a year, right, the stock market took that horrible dive, right? And then we've been climbing up, climbing up, climbing up. We haven't quite got back to where we were to start with. But, um, you know, do you think that um, we are in bubble territory in the markets? Or do you think um, we're going to see st uh, stocks going even stronger from this point? I think... What we have is worldwide assets that are certainly overvalued. Uh, we have these major stimulus uh, programs here in Australia. It's, it's a cloud pretty much. And once that cloud dissipates, we're going to be left with uh, fundamentals, which sadly aren't that great. And all these inflated asset prices, I believe, uh, are going to drop in value. We have a lot of companies that don't have a PE ratio. We have worldwide property markets on fire. 
I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And what, what has saved property owners in Australia has been the Liberal election result. And then we had that negative trajectory. And what, what, what has happened is COVID has held up the process. So what COVID has done has provided people in financial distress a window of opportunity to sell. And that's all that ha it has provided. And I don't think there's a third catalyst coming to get people out of financial trouble. Markets uh, have fully priced in the recovery. You have to look at some of the airline stocks. You look towards travel stocks. Markets tend to factor in a lot of good news. And what, what, what will surprise a lot of people is that share prices and property prices will actually start to fall on good news because it's, it's based on the greater fool theory and, you know, the greater ship of fools has, has left. So I think we're in for some extremely ugly times. And this is a chance for families, especially in Australia, to shore up their balance sheets, to sandbag their personal finances, to weather what is coming. And it's going to be the equivalent of an economic shitstorm. And I'm not looking forward to the future financially and more importantly, Martin, on a social basis. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I tend to agree. You know, I, I used the analogy the other day about Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat. And I see somebody in the chat mentioning it, right? That, you know, we're not sure whether it's dead or alive, but we won't know for a little while. But when we take a look, you know, we'll, then we'll know. But there are so many adverse indicators that people don't seem to be able to absorb and they seem fixated on everything's fine the economy is bouncing back the central banks will go on printing etc etc uh, and i just think that reality is going to dawn at some point it's going to dawn and it's going to be a harsh reality because despite the fact you know we live in australia it's a beautiful country we've got a lot going for us Australia will never defy the basic laws of economics. And I think viewers should be mindful of that. There's pretty much been a year trading halt in the property market. We've had the banking sector roll back into life. But un underneath, there is quite a weak economy. We don't have, you know, Jerry Harvey boasted of record sales at Harvey Norman. Well, you know, there was a record run on freezers, uh, electrical equipment, and these buy now, pay later schemes. But what, what consumers have done is buy a heap of crap they don't need to impress people that don't like them and vice versa. It's, it's retail insanity. And people have to realise what truly sparks joy in life. Do they want to be a slave to a mortgage? You know, I come up with a figure that if you owe $800,000 on a house, when interest rates go back to 6%, and sure as shit, they will, that is going to be the economic equivalent of being sandpapered to death when the, the real value of that house is closer to half a million dollars. So this is the chance for those who are teetering on the edge to get the hell out and to hope that there is a greater idiot to buy their overpriced assets. And that, that's all there is to it. There's nothing else to support record share prices. There's nothing to support the house prices, the absolute insanity. I mean, when you've got uh, astute financial publications such as the Daily Telegraph claiming it's a housing boom, I mean, the bell's rung. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I should say that we're playing um, Tony LeCantro Bingo. Tony, I've got four already. Well done. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Any uh, more to come? Yeah, Thanks absolutely. No, go for it. Go go for your life. All right, great. Well, let's um, flick the um, screen across to you because let's we'll go through your presentation now. Then what we'll do is we'll pick up some of the questions. Yeah. There are quite a few that we've got beforehand, plus some in the chat already, and I'm sure there'll be more. So um, I'll put you on full screen and... Uh, Go for it. Well, here we go. Um, I like to keep my slides more pictures than wordy. I know some of the presentations, people struggle with slides, but that's not me. And um, so anyway, that's, that's my disclaimer. This is 
pretty much general chat. It's not financial advice. I think people should contact a licensed financial advisor, which I'm one, but I must warn people that I'm absolutely overwhelmed with new business and I'm struggling to cope. So I'm pretty close to putting up the full house sign. Uh, to me, it's not about grabbing money. It's about providing a service to people that have been with me 20 years. So anyway, that's a disclaimer. Read that at your own discretion. And I'm going to begin with a quote that I actually created. I didn't steal this from anyone. And it has a lot of meanings within. So viewers are welcome to read that for themselves. And I think that is a reflection of where we're at. Obviously, when you're on a third date, it's the penultimate date. You're expecting probably a little bit of action with your third date. But um, you made the bad choice to go to an Indian restaurant and the rest speaks for itself. You, know, you go for a romantic walk and suddenly, you know, you start to sweat. And I think people don't understand just how fragile the property market is because it only takes a few sales in a suburb or a street and suddenly that real estate agent has that, those two magic words, which are not Anacot Steel, they're price discovery. And suddenly they can say, look, your house is only worth this. And suddenly you have a 10 to 15% correction and not much has happened. So when the bell rings, as I call it, everything looks as, as attractive as this. So I don't discriminate. There's something for the women. Men, there's something for the men and there's something there pretty much for any sexual persuasion but when every crappy listed stock on the ASX looks that attractive you know there's something wrong every person there regardless you'd probably take home but you need to find the ones that can hold a conversation and have some degree of intelligence so I think we're certainly at that stage of the market and that's pretty much, we're not far off the top. We might get a little bit more speculative further, but I think, you know, it's, it's all over Red Rover. So the analogy I like to use for my clients is, you know, the campfire is the company or the property. So on the left-hand side, uh, the guy on the left has learned three chords. He obviously wants to seduce the woman next to him, but... When the, when the crowd turns feral, there's a riot. They'll start throwing bikes into the fire. They'll start rioting. And this, this event is largely caused by people on social media breaking ranks because, let's face it, there's no friends when it comes to money and you can get a, a plethora of tips from your so-called mate. It's a bit like a Ponzi scheme. Everyone buys into a financial asset and then suddenly... When things go bad, it's on for young and old. So in saying that, I've actually picked up an acoustic guitar again, but apparently I've got a good personality, so I don't have to learn three chords. But I think this next quote is very telling when we actually revert back to fundamentals, and that is going to happen very soon. So Morgan Kelly is an Irish economist I have an enormous amount of time for, he went on an Irish program and it was in a debate with Jim Power and he said prices in Ireland are about to halve. The economy in Ireland was strong. There was a lot of construction jobs. Everything was going great. But Morgan has done extensive research on all housing bubbles. So what this means for a place like, let's use Sydney as, as an example, Let's say that the boom starts at $600,000 median. It goes to 1.2. 70% of those gains should be wiped off regardless of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the Opera House, buying a latte on Bondi Beach or buying your vitamins from Chemist Warehouse. So that actually includes wage increases. It includes inflation and we all know that wage increases are SFA, which rhymes with DFA, but that is the ugly reality of what's going to happen 
to pretty much a worldwide housing bubble. And that, that Morgan Kelly research, I actually would suggest everyone should go have a read of what he's come up with because outside of you, Martin, it's the most comprehensive research on housing bubbles. And this is a stock standard off the shelf bubble. And my argument to people is, look, times haven't changed. Markets haven't changed. The psychology hasn't changed. Now, there's the Bitcoin traders of Bridgerton. So, you know, we can go back to the 1600s. We can go back to stock markets. We can go back to the tulips. There's always con men. There's always Ponzi schemes. But the only difference what was the fashion and we've seen in other bubbles where South Korean housewives got hold of crypto and they sent it ballistic pretty much. So the psychology of markets hasn't changed for the last four to 500 years. So what, what I've done is I had a look around realestate.com and I actually grew up in French's Forest and I'm looking at a house there with an auction price guide of 1.6 million. And that's for a three bedroom townhouse on a small amount of land. Now, I believe that that, that price is absolutely ridiculous and a more realistic value is closer towards one to $1.2 million. But the housing board might say, well, hey, we've got a new hospital in French's Forest. You're still close to the beach. And once you can navigate Warringa Road and the Roseville Bridge, you're close to the city. But that is for a basic house in French's Forest. And I think that pricing is bubble territory. And those people that buy that house are in for a nasty shock. And then I went out to one of my favourite suburbs in Sydney, Jordan Springs. And, you know, this, this is an absolute joke. So someone's actually bought this house. And one of the themes of the outer western Sydney is they'd hit those hideous brown bricks. And what you're paying for, you're close to the city. I mean, it's a mere 50K trip. If you want to catch the sea breeze, uh, you've got to travel 60 kilometres. It's on a small amount of land, but that just shows how ridiculous the bubble has become in Sydney, where for half that amount, you could live a luxurious lifestyle in Leadable, where you can walk to everything, get a bus to the beach, in Perth. Admittedly, we don't have a beautiful harbour, but viewers should be mindful that in 2006, the median price in Perth was actually higher than Sydney. So I can see substantial falls when I'm suggesting that the median price in Sydney will correct first stop towards 720,000 and you're paying for that beautifully constructed house at the, at the middle of Whoop Whoop and are paying those ridiculous prices. So what it all gets back to, Martin, is this hideous situation, which actually makes me feel sick, that 1.5 million households are in mortgage trouble. Uh, that's just absolutely a sick. It makes me sick to the stomach that families have to put up with that, that they're being trapped into this, the great Australian dream where you must own a house, you know, you may slave you out to leave your kids a house. Probably some of them are just waiting for you to cark it. And I, I don't know what, what it is about our fascination with having a large backyard, you know, a hill's hoist, giving your kids the own room. I mean, there's plenty of potential to actually walk to a park, to get in a car and drive a few kilometres to a shop. But I, be you know, I believe, Martin, you were quoted there and that, that is, you know, whilst you've got the Daily Telegraph, which is Australia's preeminent financial newspaper, saying that the market is booming, the stark reality is that, that that figure is going to contribute to what I believe is going to be a nasty correction and financial oblivion to families who have done nothing but follow the mainstream press. They don't have the financial literacy to work out that they're paying 10 to 12 times average salaries to live in East Dubbo or East Broken Hill, admittedly in a nice house, but 
competing to sell with other, other houses. It's a tragic situation. So what I'm thinking is once, once the economic reality hits, Australians, we love a punt, let's be honest. So I look at that race tomorrow at Sandown and despite it, it, its odds of $81, I'm going to have a bet on Polaxed. And I think the other obvious choice in that trifecta would be face mask. And I know Damien Oliver rode, rode a horse called Pandemic recently, but Australians absolutely love a punt. And once the income dries up, I can see the gambling event really take hold. And again, for some people, based on the fact that all the second jobs are pretty much being taken, you know, they've been taken by people that actually want to work to apply for these jobs to work hard. Some of the best second income will come from winning the weekly AFL tipping. And I know that I'm going to give it a red hot crack as well. And the other, other avenue for Australians to get themselves out of trouble, well, there's a few avenues actually, uh, unless they sell their house, is to try and sell everything on Gumtree. I think the second-hand market, obviously there'll be price pressure because everyone went in and bought printers, freezers and other electrical equipment. Uh, even these retro kettles, you know, with the word smeg on them, uh, you pay 150 bucks for where you can buy one at Kmart for $17. I can see the soccer mums selling their Audi Q5s. I think the used car market has been one of the best selling opportunities of our generation. I actually took two of my cars to a dealer, sold them for a great price, and ploughed them into the one into one of the stocks I'm about to mention shortly. I think Tammy from our budget is about to be run off her feet. Uh, if she's not listing at a looking at a listing opportunity, I, I don't know what planet she's on. But I think the levels of financial distress are certainly going to come from the 1.5 million households in trouble. And I guess once all once everything fails. Couples then have to find a dumping spot for their treadmill, which obviously they bought with this work from home phenomenon. And I think you're going to see walkways littered with those lonely treadmills, those doing council cleanups over the next couple of years are actually going to struggle with the volume of crap that we've consumed during potentially leading up to one of the worst periods in Australia's economic history. So, yeah, so there's a lonely treadmill out there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that families won't be able to afford the dumping fees, so rubbish will pretty much be chucked anywhere. So on a more positive note, viewers, what I try and do for my clients over the last 23 years is actually make them money. And I'm about to run you through some suggestions where instead of betting on a horse called Polaxed, selling your Audi Q5 or ringing Tammy from my budget. Now, here's an interesting chart. Now, that chart is of the BBUS, which negative, negatively correlates with the S&P 500. So for every 1%, the S&P falls, you'll make two and a quarter to two and three quarters percent of your money. Now, that chart looks as ugly as trying to walk into Manly Beach where there's a brown tinge on the ocean. So anyone that bet against the US has seen their money pretty much disappear. Now, what I've done is I've had some success. A lot of my stocks have done extremely well. I've backed some companies from the absolute bottom. Some of them I've mentioned on this program I've actually ploughed 16% of my net wealth into betting against the US economy. Now, I believe that the S&P 500 is grossly overvalued. The Dow Jones PE ratios are through the roof. The NASDAQ stocks, you know, don't even have a PE ratio. So what, what I've decided is to sandbag my success thus far 
and not even worry about picking up more of this BBUS. And when, during that COVID crunch, it actually had quite a decent bounce. Now, my rationale for loading up is that when the S&P 500 corrects, and it will, I will then have a lot of money to go in and buy undervalued assets. And this will be like buying beachfront property on the northern beaches in the early 90s. So that, that's my rationale behind it. I don't care what the price of that does. If it continues to fall and it goes against me, I will dollar cost average. And in the end, once we get this nasty correction and it's coming, I'm going to be in a position to capitalise it rather than have a bit of cash in the bank or be holding stocks. So what I'd like to do now is run through five stocks that are highly speculative, but I'm thinking about viewers out there that might like to take the, the, the critical step into buying small companies that become bigger ones. And you must remember that a lot of these successful buy tech and mining companies were minnows in their day. I mean, some of my greatest successes included raising money for Northern Star at five cents when Bill, made, Bill Beamett made that first acquisition. I actually sold my last client out at $13.77. Admittedly, sometimes you need to forget you own the stock or be somewhere without Wi-Fi, but these are actually quality companies. I know, you know, I cop a lot of crap in comments about recommending rubbish companies, but, you know, the fact is that a lot of the major companies had to start out as minnows. And that's what I've done over the last 23 years. All I care about is backing the underdog and finding those that can provide my clients with growth. Anyway, I'm going to share five stocks with viewers and let's, let's get into it. So my first stock is Red Metal, RDM. I should make it perfectly clear that we're as full as a selective state school and we, my clients, which I call our economy, have accumulated around 10% of this company. So this has outstanding management. And what they've decided to do is spin out one of the best undeveloped silver deposits in Australia into a separate vehicle where that can finally gain some recognition. And I have believed for quite some time that silver is going to be one of the most profitable commodities slash precious metals that you can have. And I'd rather get clients set at an early stage. So what I can see is some dedicated drilling going into that project. And there's actually, there's a small chance that it might become a Cannington, which actually produces 6% of the world's silver. And interestingly, the Reddit slash GameStop Brigade tried to squeeze silver unsuccessfully. But I think that when you look at other commodities, I think silver certainly has a chance. And even though we're around $26 an ounce US, there is certainly some upside to be had. I am still buying this stock around 14 cents. As, as I mentioned before, we own about, as a collective, around 10% of the company. But I've seen some juniors that spin out their assets finally gain some value with some dedicated management and some deep drilling. But once silver, again, attracts some attention, I think that stock's going to do extremely well. And I must disclose, I have considerable personal holdings and I'm continuing to buy at the same price. Now, what, what I do as an advisor, since I've been through gold companies that have grown 20, 50, up to 300 times in value, I identify the management structures and the projects. And I've been buying the absolute crap out of a stock called Oyumin, Cody's AUN. I must, it's trading at 23 and a half to 24 cents. But what really attracted me to this stock is that the management team worked under Bill Beeman at Northern Star, which took a small gold company from one cent to $16. 
And it's often what you don't know in a small company that provides you with the greatest amount of upside. So admittedly, I'd like this share price to have some decent falls. And again, I will collect as many shares as possible because the greatest gold companies in Australia have grown from gold price weakness. And that's when majors find an asset that's not core to their theme and they'll sell these to junior companies. And Bill Beamett from Northern Star picked up a number of mines when the Australian gold index actually dropped 66%. So I know it's hard to stomach. I know all the textbooks tell you to create a stop loss. But to me, stop losses only stop profits. We're not traders. We're here to back small companies at the bottom, those that don't have any debt, that have strong management, I believe are less risky than a lot of the bigger companies on the ASX. Now I'm gonna move into a biotech, which I've invested a shitload of my own money in. Uh, this company is called Chimeric. Now they have replicated the toxin of a scorpion to treat brain cancer. To, and they're actually in phase one trials. Now Edison released a research report valuing them at multiples of where their share price is now. I've had a number of Zooms with Paul Hopper, and I believe this is potentially a biotech company of the future. It's struggling at the moment around 30 cents. But when you have a lack of news, uh, we have traders that can flip it. I mean, this is a stock where you can change your mind. If you deal through Comsec, you can change your mind 10 to 20 times a day. But if, if this synthesized scorpion toxin shows signs of treating one of the most hideous cancers imaginable, I think the upside in that stock is quite spectacular. And I am happily engaged to keep buying that company even at the current prices. And I must reiterate to viewers, Martin, that I will not be selling any of this stock. I am aligned with viewers' interests and we're continually buying. My next biotech is a company called Adulta, which have a drug which is based on the antibody of a shark to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I mean, try and say that once you've had a skinful. But they're actually, their, their safety trial has gone extremely well, and they actually have an alliance with GE Healthcare. And what I'm trying to reiterate to viewers and clients is that GE Healthcare do not align themselves with any garage operation. So I'm expecting a plethora of news to come from Adulta. The share price went on a tear to 26 and a half. It fell all the way back to 16. It's currently in that 17 cents to 18 cents range. And again, we're as full as Free Donut Friday on that company. So there's, there's two biotechs to have a look at. My next stock is Mako Gold, who have announced spectacular gold results in Africa. Peter and Anne Ledwidge previously ran a little company called Orbis Gold. The geology side, which was taken over for $187 million. And what I'm trying to suggest to people is that once you can build a gold resource, it creates value. So if you have quality ounces, let's just say a million ounces, that company should be valued between 60 and $100 million. And what Mako Gold are doing are continually announcing solid results, <coughs> pardon me, that I suggest could build a decent resource and have a market re-rating. I know Blue Ocean Equities suggested a share price target of 28 cents. They're currently trading around 10 cents. So there are some suggestions. I do have a lot of other stocks I cover, but I know that moving into this sector for a lot of people is quite difficult when you have a lot of doubts over the viability of the Australian stock market Valuations generally are high, but what, what I've found is as long as you're in a position to have to build these holdings on weakness, which I actually welcome, 
Uh, during the COVID crunch, we were able to buy companies at one third of what they are trading at today. And you've got to look at each stock where you have genuine holders and you have those in there that are there simply to sell out once things get ugly. So there, anyway, there are my stock suggestions. And what I'd also suggest to viewers is I'm nearing back up to 5,000 followers on Twitter, that Twitter is the most valuable source of stock research. If you're after anything on an, on an ASX stock, you simply put a dollar sign and the code, and you might like to key in a, a word such as exosomes or CAR-T, cancer therapy, and you come up with every dis recent discussion on that sector and I cannot value enough the benefits of researching on Twitter. Admittedly, there's a lot of crap. There's, there's a lot of people out there that have rock star status that will disappear under a rock once things turn to shit. And that's pretty much in every cycle. And I saw that in one of the biggest bubbles of my generation, which was the NASDAQ slash dot-com bubble. Anyway, I've come up with some of the most expensive words in history. And I think, you know, the two most expensive words in history are I do. I've been through two divorces. I know that on each occasion when you have kids, you lose upwards towards 80% of your net wealth. I've done that twice. Do the math. Uh, once you tell someone you love them, again, you set yourself up for failure. And the four most expensive words in history are this time is different. And that relates to interest rates, lower for longer, no signs of the RBA lifting rates to 2024. What a load of absolute bollocks when we should really consider, even though we're well below it, the long-term RBA cash rate is still around 6% and the average mortgage payments over the long term are still around 9%. Now, you do the maths on an $800,000 mortgage with principal and interest on an asset that drops 30 to 40%, and that is, again, the economic equivalent of being sandpapered to death. So this time isn't different. It's an off-the-shelf speculative bubble fueled by a global pandemic where some of the Eastern European countries have 5% of their population with COVID. And I know some family members aligned with one of my best friends on the planet have had COVID and they've temporarily lost their sense of taste and smell and they haven't recovered quickly. And I think that the longer term effects of COVID won't be known for a long time because it's only just begun. And this, you know, this time isn't different. We still have low interest rates fueling this absolute asset insanity and it's all going to end. And it doesn't have to involve an increase in interest rates. It just has to include an exhaustion of buyers and a slight change in sentiment. So what, what I do in my life, uh, I've had, look, a lot of success on the stock market, but it's all about what sparks joy in your life. And there we have the two things that sparks joy in my life. Uh, the dog on the left sits, sits here and keeps me company all day. The person on the right I refer to as my 9.5, and it's actually proof that personality can get you somewhere when you're lacking in the looks department. So anyway, that's my um, slideshow. Thanks, Tony, and congratulations. You filled yeah. your complete bingo card. Really? I, th I thought you were going to miss out sandpapering, but no, we got that towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, Martin. I love it. <laughs> no, no, it's good. And uh, look, I, I always um, uh, like the... Um, direct way which you you know approach all of this and uh, you know people can take it or leave it but the point is yeah. that you've got a very clear view right and and just to reiterate there's, there's a couple of questions that came through in the chat which i just want to go go back to one of them was uh from donna who, who's basically asked the question why are you 
talking about these stocks you know you're trying to get people to buy them um i think it's just worth underscoring you've done the research on these stocks right and the reason you're talking about them is because you believe they have potential value oh absolutely i i get to know management i get to know the psychology of the market and i'll only ever talk about stocks that i'm happy to buy tomorrow and i, I think it's a difficult area to for people to get involved in, it's hard to take that next step. But all the bigger companies in Australia were once smaller companies, and it's up to me to identify them. And what, what I've tried to provide is five stocks that have underlying fundamental value, either with in-ground resources or management that can take them further. And if you get a, a breakthrough on brain cancer, even, even though you're not going to cure it, if you can simply extend the life of someone with brain cancer, to me, that's a win. If you can save someone's life who has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where there's no cure, you die within three to five years, you're doing a good thing. And when, when you have GE Healthcare involved with that company, you know that that's a real deal. And I've identified these companies over 23 years I've left a hell of a lot of money on the table, but I've raised $4 million for companies that have turned into multi-billion dollar companies that have paid 100 times more tax than what I raised them. And, and for me, the speculative market, is, it's all about psychology. I need to know what the enemy's doing, and that's the other side of the screen, whether I'm buying or selling. But, you know, you don't have to follow the herd I've got myself aligned with the best geologists in the country. I also go and I'm on the panel at a biotech conference in Queenstown. I get to know the biotech people. Uh, the biotech people tend to have a greater sense of humour because the, the, the default position of a biotech company is failure. Let's face it, most new drugs fail. But I'm here to create the life-changing wins I'm not here to simply buy banking stocks on someone's recommendation. So I'll only ever talk about stocks I'm on the buy side, Martin. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the point, you know. So your particular perspective, I think, is important, but people need to understand it. You know, somebody was saying, well, you need to be careful about investing in stocks. I always say, yeah, you've got to be really careful. So when you build a portfolio, what you want to do is to create a central pool of hopefully relatively low risk investments to sort of form a core as it were but around the edge from that you can be a bit more speculative and i would suggest that some of the things we're talking about here would be a little bit round the edge you wouldn't put the whole of your superannuation in or the whole of your savings in right but what you would do is perhaps say well i can afford to take a bit more risk with that part and if it goes up you know and there are five stocks that you talked about well not all of them may actually perform well but if one of those five five really comes through then it's going to actually significantly give your portfolio a kick but that's the trick right and i always talk to people about structure 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 don't put all the eggs in one basket don't put all of your superannuation in bitcoin you know because it might go up but it might go down right so i mean that's how that's my philosophy i don't know whether that makes any sense to you tony but that's how i think about it i think you've got to have high conviction higher investments, less stock. So that's what I focus on is portfolio diversification to create the most upside. Every stock I look at has to provide me with a clear path towards 500% upside if it comes off. And what I've noticed recently is I've actually had a few new clients sign up with me who are pilots, who were captains flying without a care in the world that have now been retired at the age of 55 and are looking to try and make some money. And I think that's the shock of what's happened to the global travel industry and the whole world, basically financially and socially. But look, I research the crap out of these companies. It's not for everyone. I have 230 people I look after that are prepared to take the risks. But as I reiterate good fundamentally sound companies always come through even when the dow jones gets smacked down 10 percent so i see the stock market as a mechanism to buy undervalued assets 
which are going to be prone to volatility from 30 stocks on the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. So I, I'm not here to try and get people to buy these stocks to force the prices higher, but I'm showing that, you know, the likes of Northern Star, the likes of Saracen, Regis, and every successful company has come from the pennies. Yeah, good point. Now, there were a bunch of questions I got beforehand as well as the ones on the chat. I just missed touch the first one right we sort of touched on it but let's just be clear about this right so the question this is from chris and from paul and a couple of others too um how do you know when a market is overvalued and what's the difference between fundamental value and momentum trading and which do you do i'm, I'm purely fundamentals i i won't jump on a trend uh you've got to look at essentially pe ratios stocks, the larger financial companies. Forget PE ratios on the buy now, pay later companies because they're, they're pretty much they don't exist. So I've actually had this massive NASDAQ bubble, which has rivaled what happened in 1999-2000. So I really search for fundamental value. But in every speculative bubble, you only have a handful of winners. And that goes way back to the nasdaq.com it goes to uranium it goes to child care it goes to retractable syringes it will go from lithium vanadium chrysanthemum eventually to imodium so people have to realize is that these are pretty much ponzi schemes where you'll hear a tip from a mate you'll tip four mates at a barbecue then it'll be tipped around mother's groups and suddenly you have a huge increase, increase in share prices, then the Twitter brigade get onto it. So we've had some stocks intraday in Australia over the last month put on 700% because a Facebook gang targeted that stock. So pretty much momentum trading is dangerous when you're dealing with lots of fake buys and sells on the screen, you're dealing with computer driven high frequency trading to me stick to the fundamentals and there was this marvelous quote out of wall street where quick buck artists come and go in every bull market but the steady players make it through the bear markets so look i'll go back to the nikkei in 1989 it was priced at 52 times price to income where i mean sorry pe ratio but you had companies like Japan Airlines, which were trading at 600 times earnings. So PE ratios, you'll see them out of kilter with major indices, but they always eventually revert back to the norm and then sadly overshoot to the downside. But another point I must reiterate to people is that they say, well, the market's so high, it must crash. But share prices can fall from low levels and sentiment can go you can have selling that goes on longer than what you think and dumb money can last a lot longer and we've seen the dumb money in all asset classes <laughs> plenty of dumb money around absolutely now russ asked an yep. interesting question um i'll put this on the screen so everybody can see it too tony your views on current bond rates both australian and u.s continue to rise with significant dollars thrown in at them or what? Well, think about it. Uh, I'll bring up a bad example. You know, you're swimming at Lane Cove Pool and you're trying to push a beach ball down underwater. That's what's happening with interest rates. You can put as much pressure to subdue the longer term interest rates as you like, but it's trying to bounce. Rates have to go higher and what we're seeing is all this pressure to look at the RBA cash rate, which is sitting at an at a absurd level. Worldwide interest rates are well beyond emergency levels, but all the pressure is saying rates have to go higher. We've seen the RBA say, look, you know, we need to reach this 2 to 3% inflation ban before rates are lifted. What an absolute load of rubbish that in order to stamp out what could become frightening inflation, we're going to have to see some interest rate rises. 
And the fear of an interest rate increase is far worse than the actual event itself. And that could see a flood of properties onto the market. It could spell trouble, obviously, for the stock market as well. So it's, um, it's getting ugly, Martin, and you can throw as much as you can at it, but bond markets and equities markets cannot defy the basic laws of economics, and it's not going to happen. This time isn't different. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there was a couple of people who asked earlier on, um, why do bond yields and bond prices go in opposite directions, right? And I said I'd just briefly recap there's a show that I made a couple of weeks ago which explains this in more detail. But if you assume that a bond is an IOU and it gives, let's say, it'll pay you $100 in three years' time, at par, you'd buy it now and hold it and you'd pay $100 and then you'd get the $100 back in three years' time, right? But if rates are expected to go up, then that deal doesn't sound so good. So effectively, if rates down the future are going to be higher, you're going to want to pay less for that $100 in three years' time because it's going to be worth less than it would be otherwise, right? And that's why bond rates and prices move in opposite directions. It's one of those fundamental philosophical points you've got to get your head around. And when you do, what you realise then is as people sell, right, things move the other way than you might otherwise expect. So that's, in a nutshell, how it works. I don't know whether I've explained it clearly, uh, Tony, but that's how I think about it. Oh, that, that That's awesome, Martin. I think that's you know, you've saved someone a year off the uni degree on the bond market. So, well, done. <laughs> Excellent. well yeah. it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it, it, you know, I've, I follow the bond markets quite closely because I do think they are a very important leading indicator. And it does actually take us into this really interesting question as to inflation or deflation, you know, down the track, right? Because there are so many more people now basically saying, this is going to lead to inflationary pressures that will flow through into the real economy, and we're going to see interest rates rising very quickly. Um, as a result of that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, I sort of say, well, that could well be, but there's also a deflationary angle as well. Um, I personally think that deflation is more like to be than inflation for the reason that inflation can be on the supply side and the demand side, and wages growth it's traditionally been a critical element that actually drives inflation. Now, there's no prospect of wages growth in Australia over the next three or four years. In my view, the Reserve Bank pretty much says as much as well. And in fact, if you look over the last 10 years, wages growth has been zero. There's been none. So I have a feeling that the expectations about inflation may, might be overdone. We'll see it in patches. But I'm not sure that structural inflation is actually what we're going to see. But Tony, I don't know whether you've got a different view, but that, that's how I see it. I'm slightly in this stagflation camp. So stagflation is, of course, a recession with some inflation. And I think some of the ugliest economic times in Australia and the US were in the uh, 70s, where we had that price spike and a recession at the same time. And some of my fondest memories, memories of growing up in the early 70s were queuing up for petrol on odds and even days. And I think that that was pretty much a very tough economy to negotiate. But house prices then were three to four times income. Now they're 12, 13 times. So I think the debt levels were lower. It was a, a pretty harsh time to survive in the economy, but we got through it. So I think there's certainly a risk of stagflation. But heaven help us if we get a rampant outbreak of inflation because we're going to have to see a rapid increase in interest rates and that will absolutely kill mainly the property market. And um, I just see hopefully we get a slow reversion towards the norm. So, you know, if you take out a 30-year mortgage, you might get 25 3%. But I believe during that period, rates, you will be paying 9% on your mortgage. And with bugger all wage growth, you're in a lot of trouble. And I think we're too focused on what, what's happening at present. But I, I still think, you know, we could go that way or, or we could turn Japanese where the elderly find prison more attractive so they commit petty crimes to go and get three meals a day in a comfortable place to live. 
Yeah, and it's worth reminding everybody that Japan has been at the negative rates longest and the quantitative easing longest, and the central bank in Japan owns more of their economy than pretty much any other country around the world. Uh, the eurozone isn't that far behind in terms of negative rates, and, uh, and, and neither of those two environments have created inflation, right? So, uh, so far, the central banks, despite the fact they do quantitative easing and do more and more and more of it to try and actually create the momentum that they want to see, haven't been successful. So it'll be interesting to see whether it's different this time. And, you know, speculation may well be the name of the game. It's just worth reflecting on the $8 trillion that the Fed's put into the system over the last 12 months or so, right? And the $28 trillion, I think, totally in the, around the world, if you take all of the central bank interventions and all of the other government uh, stimulus as well, massive amounts of liquidity thrown into the markets, right? And one of the reasons why that might explain some of the bubbly nature of the stock markets. But the question is how much of that's hitting the real economy? How much is that flowing through towards um, employment and those sorts of things? And bear in mind that in Australia, of course, the government is actually trying to get its IR bill through, which essentially is going to depress um, earnings even further. And it's worth reflecting on this, uh, that of course, um, Morrison's talking about getting migration to come back, right, to get more low-paid people to come into the country. So um, how are you going to get wage inflation with, it, with that as well? So to my mind, those are the things that are worth watching. Somebody asked a little while ago, what are the leading indicators? I think that the, the wages question is, is worth, worth watching really, really importantly, right? Because it is going to be a very interesting um, interesting journey you know from this point i'm just not convinced that the conditions are necessary in play to really see a rampant inflation take off it could be wrong and i've said the problem is it could be inflation it could be deflation it could be stagflation all those three are potential you know scenarios depending on how things how things may may work out and i'll just want to make one other point remember of course that the reserve bank has now basically prohibited the treasury from allowing their treasury bonds to be uh, sold for shorts so they're trying to control the yield curve <laughs> even more so at the three-year level which is one of the reasons why um the uh, the bond rates yeah, have come back a little bit well i was going to say can you bet against the market tony that's the question i guess isn't it Yeah, well, in, you, you're faced with this unique situation where COVID's turned the world on its head. I mean, a bad example is vacancy rates in West Perth were 2%. <laughs> now they're approaching 30. So we've had a demographic shift in how people do business. We can say, look, immigration will come in and support the economy because they'll buy million dollar houses in Jordan Springs. I mean, that's just like an ugly person saying beauty is on the inside. I've heard all these absolute rubbish excuses to support house prices, to support overinflated asset prices. But get back to it. It's just a speculative bubble that we're seeing for hundreds of years. And it's all fed on cheap money. It's FOMO. It's the mainstream press. So, I mean, sentiment can change very quickly and it's only going to take a few thousand point nights on the US drop and sentiment will change and we'll start to see house prices fall. They did leading up to the election and COVID. I mean, I've actually happily conceded my bet with Stephen Kukoulos. I've said, look, I want to pay you out. It's not going to happen. But the only thing I believe I've got wrong is timing, which was held up by the election and COVID. And I've asked Stephen to send me his bank account details and he hasn't gotten around to it. But just because the correction hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it will. And certainly leading to those two life-saving events, the trajectory was certainly suggesting that I would have easily won that bet, Martin. So to me, the world has been in pretty much a trading halt. Property trading, especially in Melbourne and Sydney, to an extent, has been suspended. I think all that stimulus you talk about, especially the people in the US, 
will go into comp high growth companies such as Blockbuster Video, Hertz, or you know GameStop, which is actually the host, the parent company of EB Games, where you struggle to find a crowd in nowadays. So it's not going to go into Disney, McDonald's, or Coke, or Boeing. It's going to go into those rubbish stocks. And we've seen this day trading phenomenon take hold, where social media groups. I mean, I, I liken a, a new investor that makes money on the stock market to discovering how to self-satisfy satisfy themselves around the age of 10 or discovering the 11 secret herbs and spices. I mean, in the end, it's not that great. <laughs> uh, interesting analogy, Tony. I always, uh, I always <laughs> love your analogy. It's really good. Now, here's a, here's a, a follow-up question from, from Russ just quickly. Um, do you see any chance of a rate rise this year, either RBA or banks moving out of cycle? Um, I'll let you go first, then I'll, I'll have a little go of that myself, I think. I mean, look, I think the banks will go out of cycle, but why not do it on Melbourne Cup Day when most of the countries had a skin full and won't realise it till the day after? <laughs> I think Melbourne Cup Day is the odd ideal day to lift interest rates so i hopefully the rba will hang on uh once you know people in perth will be poleaxed uh, by pretty much by midday anyway so but i i see that banks will start to lift the longer term fixed rates realizing what's actually going to occur i mean these interest rates have been too low for too long and i think russ makes an it's an excellent question and, you know, what you speak about, Martin, is being a mortgage prisoner where you're unable to refinance. And what about all those people that haven't put in their tax return, that don't have proof of income, that are too scared to go and get a better deal when they have to reveal a major drop in income? So we've got mortgage prisoners paying too much interest and principal even if they can afford to do it so i'd expect the banks to move before the rba and uh look be prepared for an economic shock once you're onto your fourth glass of um birth well i think uh, i already am ah, so. very good. Well, well, <laughs> drunk in charge of a live show <laughs> Don't, yeah. no no i'm fine i'm <laughs> fine it just um no I'm, I'm going well it just adds to the uh yeah but yeah. all good but no Excellent creates a little question. little Martin, extra would, momentum. Yeah, I, I'm on the water, so yeah. that's fine. Um, look, my, my yeah. view is this. Um, the term funding facility from the Reserve Bank, which is providing really, really cheap funds to the banks, is going to end in June. Right? Now, they might extend it, but I suspect they probably won't. And that means that at that point, the banks are going to have to access higher cost funding in the bond markets. Now, we know that the bond rates are going up. And uh, there is a few examples of bonds now being issued at 3% and above, which suggests to me that the price of money to the banks is going to go up. So I think the first sign that we're going to see is not the Reserve Bank moving, but it will be a change in the rates for some of the fixed rate mortgages. And I've been saying to people for a little while, you know, those five-year rates at 1.8 or 1.9, right, you'll never see those again in my lifetime. They are worth... Um, worth grabbing if you need a fixed rate. I think they are remarkably um, low at the moment and there are a few more discounts to come. But I think around June and beyond that, we'll probably start to see them go the other way. Whether the Reserve Bank will stick with its policy of controlling the three-year curve and they move the, uh, the, 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 the bond that they're actually controlling out a little bit uh, quite recently, um, is going to be a really interesting question because it's going to create more and more distress on the bank to be able to do that. They're going to have to effectively control more and more of the yield curve and control more and more of the bond market to be able to keep the rate where they want it. So the question is, can they do that or will they actually have to capitulate? Now, it's interesting that uh, um, Philip Lowe has come out over the last few days on a couple of occasions that we are absolutely committed to keeping the uh, rate low for at least three years, etc., etc., and it won't do anything until we see inflation coming up and we see wage growth coming up. And you know, unemployment should be well four percent or maybe even three something, right? Which would be remarkable if they ever got there, right? I mean, those are the conditions that they're setting 
for controlling the economy, right? I don't think they're in control, frankly. I think that they're going to be um, a cork on the water. And I think the international flows, particularly from the US, will probably have a stronger f impact on what the Reserve Bank does. So my own view is it's certainly quite conceivable that we're going to see the Reserve Bank having to move sooner than they think. Whether that will be this year, Melbourne Cup Day, we'll have a check of that to later, Tony, or whether it will be a bit uh, later into next year, I think is the question. Um, part of that depends on what happens with the overall economy and you know the employment rate and those sorts of things. But we are in a fairly precarious situation, bearing in mind that there's no such thing as a free market anywhere at the moment, right? All these markets are being controlled by central banks. They are basically doing using yield curve control. They're using uh, all the other kits, um, you know, parts that they've got to try and actually control things. What they're actually doing is just swamping the entire economy with more and more liquidity, which is why the money supply is going through the roof. But if you look at the velocity of money, right, which is how quickly is it going around the system and what value is it creating, it's getting slower and slower and more and more sluggish. So in a way, it's not working. So, you know, at what point do central banks say, OK, we give up, we can find another route? Or do they just keep on doing more of the same and... Uh, if they're going to do more of the same, then they've got to do it not just linearly, but logarithmically. So they've got to actually continue that acceleration into the future. So that's how I see it. So I think um, expect private banks to move before the RBA. Yeah, no, it's a pretty, pretty ugly situation. And going back to my first quote, markets are that fragile that these people in high paid positions that everyone listens to, that wouldn't know a speculative bubble if it fell over them, are having to make those brave calls and to see interest rates not moving in Australia within three years is absolutely ludicrous when they're struggling to hold down the longer uh, bond yields. It's, it's, it just cannot happen. And speculative markets to burst don't need an event. They just need an exhaustion of buyers. You know, what happens if some of those 1.5 million households in mortgage stress decides to start offloading their properties? What about those that bought in good areas in Sydney in the early 90s that are sitting on multiple lotto wins decide to start selling? There is no one to sell it to. Someone coming in immigration-wise that has to get a work visa they're not going to go out and buy a $2 million knockdown in camp, for Christ's sake. I don't know what drugs people are on. They just don't understand how markets work. And these, you know, to me, an ec economics degree with a bachelor of this is, is like being handcuffed because you're tied to what you know, whereas markets, every market is out of kilter with economic reality. And I'd rather treat markets as a street fight. As I said, I'm fighting people in small cap stocks. But once a street in Sydney turns ugly, it's on for young and old, and then you'll have fear start to set in. And I think what the RBA will be forced to do is lift rates 0.15 and then go in quarter of a percent increments. I just think they've got to go slowly Otherwise, the shock to the system will be too much. But you cannot control human fear, greed or stupidity. No amount of economic policy of, or helicopter money can stop fear. That's it. End of story. It's an off-the-shelf speculative bubble. If you're in financial distress or if you're, you've made $5 million on your house, get the hell out. Now's the time to do it. Now's the time to sell that Orbit Fitness treadmill that no one will want to buy in a couple of months' time. Get rid of the Audi. Don't worry about being a soccer mum because you've got to get back to what sparks joy in your life and that's not a friggin' 30-year mortgage where you're going to be paying at some point $60,000 minimum in interest to hold on to an asset that's going to drop 30 to 40%. I mean... People need to wake up. I mean, this COVID pandemic has been like the whole of Australia on friggin' happy gas. 
uh, I can't put it any more bluntly that here is your chance to escape going bankrupt. And I know someone that's just been thrown a house in Perth that can't even earn $40,000 a year, it's going to struggle, and she's just signed her ticket to bankruptcy. And, uh, you know, and I, I try and live a humble life. I live in a small unit. I mainly drive around in a beaten up 2006 vehicle. But what, for me, what sparks joy is being going out to a restaurant, ordering a nice steak, and at, at, in Woolies, throwing in some smoked salmon into the trolley. To me, that's financial freedom, not worrying about where the next mortgage repayment is coming from. But central banks and the RBA cannot stop what's coming once the vaccination takes hold and people have to revert back to earning, actually earning a living and where all the second jobs are taken by people that will actually get out and do hard work and not expect a handout. So I just cannot be positive, Martin. Unless, unless you are a viewer of this channel, you've taken steps you put yourself in, you hold physical gold and silver, you look at some ETFs that can support what you do, and you look at growth mechanisms for the future and not go, not take your financial advice off the Daily Telegraph or the Financial Review. Yeah, and in this environment, you know, debt is, uh, I think, one of the things that people need to think very seriously about, right? Because as you say, debt costs and that can be painful. Just a quick acknowledgement to Jason. He might have already gone, but thanks, Jason. I really appreciate the uh, contribution there. It's uh, greatly uh, appreciated to help uh, cover the cost of what we do here. Um, and uh, there was an interesting uh, question that um, came in as well, which was, um, let me just find the, uh, this, was this one here from uh, Bondi Steve. Um, what are the inventory numbers like in Australia now? Are businesses running down stocks while jumping and, and clapping? Now, I can give you a couple of um, instances there. We know, for example, in fact, Edwin covered this on the um, show last night on the on the rant, that um, builders are getting finding it very difficult to buy the stocks of materials that they need, particularly timber, to be able to actually do the construction. In fact, some of the building companies... Uh, have gone to Bunnings and pretty much bought all of the available timber that's there. Um, China has stopped importing timber from Australia. Uh, China was effectively turning that uh, raw material into finished goods for construction and then putting them back into Australia again. But that, that cycle has been um, disrupted. And we also know that... Um, the um, demand is also strong internationally. So builders are finding it quite difficult to get materials. And in fact, I was talking to somebody the other day who is in the process of trying to lock in a contract to build a property. And that contract has gone up by 22% since they first started negotiating it two months ago. Right? And it's because of the cost of materials and the cost of labour. So that's one example where you're actually seeing this hit on the ground. I also know from my other surveys, that, from the SME surveys, that many SMEs have been running down their inventories and basically not buying new stuff and not investing at all because they're very uncertain about what's going to happen. You know, some people are saying there'll be another 250,000 um, um, people unemployed at the end of March because of the end of JobKeeper. That's probably a reasonable estimate, might be slightly more. But we know there are a lot of small businesses who are only just hanging on by their fingernails. And unfortunately, the um, incentive schemes that the government have now thrown out to the tourist sector, which I regard, frankly, as just supporting the airlines, pretty much that's all, um, won't cut it. So I would expect to see more businesses continuing to drive inventory lower. And in fact, this isn't just a local issue. It's a phenomenon which we're seeing in other countries too. So I think inventory is a good leading indicator. I don't know whether you've got any comments on that, Tony, but just giving you my perspective on that. Well, especially in Perth, where they've thrown everything at, at new homes, uh, you know, they've created the most attractive prisons you could have. You know, you've got a, a beach there that's often windswept and you're miles from anything. So, yes, there has been a construction boom. Raw materials are hard to get. Admittedly, now that with the borders open, we're going to start to see 
the flow of more used cars, which is pretty much at the top of the market. So get rid of that soccer mum car. But again, I think we're going to start to see more of a flow of raw materials that will start to alleviate those pressures. But again, uh, it, it's been a world thrown upside down where we've had supply chains interrupted. We've had lots of government incentives as well. So I, I think that, you know, certainly those levels will start to fall. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting comment. Yeah. <laughs> just just okay, discuss. I just Tony. see that comment. <laughs> Tony's Do lost you... it. There's no way the RBO central banks can let assets deflate. The question is, can they stop the deflation, right? You, you can't. I mean, are you going to knock on Pamela from Penrith store and tell her not to sell a house? You cannot. Uh, I, I think that we've had this period of high asset prices. No amount, you know, you've pretty much, the RBA pretty much now is out of ammunition. The government is out of stimulus. You know, you can keep offering a free Yaris or a cruise or an incentive for someone to buy a unit. But central banks cannot, have never been able to control asset prices. And that stems way back. You know, you look at the 1929 stock market crash or you look at the Japanese government trying to support the Nikkei when it, it collapsed in 89.90. So I, I just think that you've got no chance of these banks or bodies stopping fear setting in. And I think that I totally disagree with Paul. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And anyone that thinks that you can have your million dollar property you can tiptoe through the tulips. You can pay 2% for the next 30 years. I think it's de it's delusional and certainly I've lost a friend, but I cannot disagree with that comment more, Martin. That's, I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's what I like. Clear perspectives. And, uh, you know, the point about this channel is we'll debate these things. You don't have to agree. Um, now, this is one which I'm not sure I can add much light to but um we've had the question asked a couple of times do you think combank's pearl issue at 2.75 plus bbsw makes any sense given combank are lending at way less well i'll give you my perspective and then tony may, may come in as well uh, insofar of course yep. that cba is getting really cheap money at the moment from from uh from the reserve bank right and uh, we also know that they are actually um laying off more expensive bonds that they had issued earlier as well so they're actually sort of managing down the the, the net funding rates the thing about these of course is they're um, you know basically convertibles right so that's the other thing to bear in mind uh, which is why they have to pay quite a high um, premium and frankly my own view is that um, you might find the conversion um, ratios come quicker than many people think I generally don't like these particular structures but um, I don't know Tony whether you have an alternative view I'd, I'd steer well clear of them, especially considering that the strong run in bank share prices, the conversion, admittedly the interest rate looks attractive relative to a savings account or term deposit, but, but based on, I think, the financial stress coming, I'd certainly stay with, away from anything like that. And I'd, I'd certainly look now towards another round of profit taking in bank stocks and I, I know for a lot of people, they don't know where to put the money, but, you know, you just spread it amongst banks. You just keep yourself pretty much safe without looking at exotics. And what pretty much, I think, with the gambling culture of Australia, people are going to look for exotics. We'll probably see a, a shitload more cryptocurrency scams coming in. We'll see more lotteries. Um, it will just see people start to lose whatever money they have left trying to get rich quick. So, you know, once all bets are off in the financial sector, the property sector, the ASX has turned into a dangerous casino. I, I just would steer clear of anything like that, even though 2.75% looks attractive. And mind you, uh, I have a benchmark with my clients for outperformance. It's called the Bernie Madoff Index. 
which ensures that we must get more than 11% per annum, which is pretty much what Bernie guaranteed everyone. So I don't think there's anything as a sure thing on this earth, Martin. And um, I just think people need to get a reality check. They need to sandbag their finances, get rid of overpriced assets, hold that garage sale before your neighbour does, and think realistically that, you know, COVID, once we get vaccinated, travel will start to open up. And then everybody has got to fend for themselves like we used to before this hideous pandemic struck. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a very interesting uh, follow up question, which um, Bryce asked. And Bryce, thank you very much for the contribution there. Appreciate it. What are the safest assets to move cash into to hedge against deflation and or inflation? I'll let you go first, Tony, then I'll have a bit of a go at it as well. Yeah, I look, I look at gold. Uh, in the early 70s, 700 ounces of gold bought you a house and 700 ounces of gold now would buy you a two-bed up asbestos house in Campsie or somewhere like that. So gold has actually maintained its purchasing power. So I'd certainly keep some money in the bank spread across a number of banks, even though that guarantee is not as good or attractive as it sounds. But you're talking to someone that, I am still swinging hard. I don't go terribly defensive, but apart from putting 16% roughly of my net wealth in a product that bets against the US market and economy. So you can look at some, some ETFs to protect, protect you from the downside. I wouldn't touch financial stocks with your money. I wouldn't be buying zip pay, after pay, or any of these tech darlings, these ridiculous prices but there are some higher yielding stocks on the asx which could could give you a bit of yield but you're still a, you know prone to that downside risk so in in a market like this there's pretty much nowhere to hide unless you have a bit of an understanding that there's going to be a lot of winners there's going to be companies that are able to look at treating some of these hideous effects of COVID. I think we're going to head into quite a big biotech bubble. We're going to see, now we're seeing a bit of a hydrogen bubble. The EV theme has certainly shone through. You've got copper that's breached $9,000 a tonne. But, you know, you can go to a financial planner and get three pages of cut and paste. But, you know, now is not the time to be passive. I mean, the baby boomers have sat on their asses since 1995 when house prices broke away from wages and made an absolute shitload of money by inertia. Now they've actually got to think. So there's no such thing as a free ride anymore. You need to protect your own finances. I just think a lot of Australians rely on tips. They're not prepared to do the research but you certainly have to get some help. And I mean, gold and silver, you can buy it through the Perth Mint or you can look at some ETF products where they trade like an ordinary share. And one of the advantages has been that the Aussie dollar gold price has been poleaxed from, you know, 27 to about 2,200. So a lot of gold companies were spitting cash. Now you've got that lower Australian gold price, but that's something that can provide purchasing power in the future. And that's what you're probably going to look at with uh, the environment we're in. Yeah, and Eileen, thanks very much. Appreciate the super chat. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Tony, I, I guess my perspective is a bit different. Right? I think it depends. You, you've almost got to make a, a decision as to whether you think it's going to be inflationary or deflationary because the strategies you would use would be quite different and it's hard to know which way it's going to go so to an extent you either say well either i can't tell in which case you try to be neutral or you actually say no it's going to be inflationary in which case you go one way or deflation you go another way right so my own perspective would be this that um 
in the deflationary environment, you don't want gold and silver particularly because they're not actually going to perform very well relative to other uh, things. But if it's inflationary, then gold and silver actually provide good protection and uh, have, have weathered the storm before, right? So you can see that immediately it creates a, a dichotomy of, of outcomes, right? My own strategy has been to say, I think we're in a very uncertain time at the moment and I want to stay relatively liquid because I think there will be opportunities later to buy back into the market and um, whether it's probably or whether it's actually um, stock markets at a better point than currently because I think stock markets are extended at the moment and therefore um, other than a bit of stock picking and I agree there are opportunities where you might actually say I'm going to you know invest in a few around the edge of that portfolio so I tend to want to be relatively liquid and I tend to want to be relatively um, open to opportunities later right now patience Patience, patience, patience sometimes is, is quite a good strategy in, in the current environment. Now, some people wouldn't agree with that, but that, that, that's, what I, that's what I think. The other point I'd make is that you've got to watch this for the signs, right? So if you start seeing the inflationary signs beginning to take, then you take positions appropriately, same on the deflation side. So you've got to be keeping an eye on this. You can't do a set and forget. You can't just say, right, I'm going to do that and then do nothing about it later, right? You've got to actually be monitoring this because I think what I've learned is we're probably in one of the most uncertain environments ever from a financial perspective. There's no simple way out of this from where we are at the moment. And there are going to be lots of other factors coming in over the top that will make it way more confusing for a long period of time. So uncertainty isn't going to go away. So a bit of flexibility, a bit of openness keeping an eye but frankly my own position is I'm not sure that gold and silver is necessarily that good of bet at the moment yeah fair call Martin but what you've got to realize is that we have a certain degree of financial lit literacy where most of Australia are currently concerned about who's cheating on who in married at first sight so you know Australians are pretty blase about everything They've had this dream run since 1995, but I don't think, you know, families can sit there and do a decent budget and do a stress test on their mortgage, which I'd be doing at 6%. So what this channel, obviously, is it inspired some very intelligent people that I talk to them every day that know where to put their assets, that are selling houses, that are renovating houses in, in Melbourne at the moment, to sell to a greater idiot and then can sit on some cash. Admittedly, that money isn't going to earn any interest, but to be honest, who is? So I just think we're dealing with a population that's financially illiterate, that is too emotionally attached to their house. <laughs> I think, well, I've had great memories. I used to get on the swing here, but they don't, they don't realise the fight they had over their veggies or in some cases, some quite heated arguments. You know, and the only time that a sentimental asset is worth anything is when you can afford to hang on to it. So again, all this crap about, oh, the memories the kids grew up here, my kid needs to have his own room, they need a backyard. I think people will struggle to detach themselves from them, their house until the bank foreclosures on them. And that's, that's what we're going to have. That's going to be the capitulation phase. And that phase is certainly coming. And it's to a lot of asset classes. So what I'd rather do, you've got inflation, stagflation, deflation. I say to hell with all that, there's always going to be companies that are going to provide outstanding returns that are small. They're going to turn into bigger companies. Because if I analysed everything all markets, all economies, I probably wouldn't buy any asset. So sometimes knowing less provides more. And I just can't see any family uh, getting away from binging and discussing their finances. It's just not going to happen. And we're, gonna, we're stuck with a population uh, where a lot of them are going to be absolutely financially slaughtered and then it'll be a blame game. Yeah, there will definitely be a blame game and laws, I'm sure, will be involved. Now, Eileen asked a very important question, which I just wanted to um, uh, talk. And uh, Tony, thank you very much for your con contribution, by the way. Um, 
So mm. Eileen said, is it safe to keep cash at the bank? I've sold my house and waiting for a correction. Am I at risk? So there's a couple of interesting observations there, and that relates firstly to the insurance deposit scheme that exists uh, for Australian banks, right? And that is actually an APRA scheme, and that covers uh, up to $250,000 in a bank brand. So in other words, if you have St. George and Westpac, um, that's one brand combined, right? And it's basically per account or per account. So you could have a sole account and a joint account. There will be two. But if you're actually, um, you know, basically both two sets of accounts, it's St. George and Westpac, it's only 250k protected. So that's the first point. So that scheme exists, but it needs to be activated by the government if, in fact, um, a bank fell over. And it's trying to protect people in the situation where a bank fails. Now, given what we've seen with regard to the government's support for the banking sector, I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to see a bank failure anytime soon. So I think keep below the 250k limit, right? The other thing to think about is the so-called bail-in. So this is deposit bail-in. Now, a few years ago, there was a big fear that potentially there could be a bail-in in Australia. In other words, they'd come and knock on your door and say, I want some of your deposit and we'll give you um, uh, equity in the bank instead, right? And New Zealand, it's a very clear strategy. It's completely open, you know, the open banking resolution, it's called. In Australia, ba bail-in is really not likely, I think, at the moment to happen. And in fact, we know that within the government circles, there are attempts now to take it off the table more clearly by changing the rules around APRA. So my own view is at the moment, the banks here are relatively safe. Keep below the 250K, spread your risks. Um, maybe just avoid some particular banks, but I'm not going to go into detail as to what those might be, other than to say we know some of them have higher exposures to, for example, interest-only mortgages. Might be worth thinking about that. And some of the smaller players, you know, the building societies and credit unions, have a much more conservative approach to managing their risks, managing their portfolios, and aren't exposed to derivatives. So I tend to go for some of the smaller players rather than the big ones. So that's my sort of short summary of is money safe in the bank? Relatively, yes, is my, is my solution. Yeah, I actually had a couple come to me with $2 million cash the first thing I said to them was spread, get eight bank accounts, spread that around. And I reiterated to them that the share ownership in structure in Australia is one of the safest in the world. So you can buy shares through me and just say in the unlikely event of my firm going broke, you can transfer, transfer them to any stock market operator or, or broker. But... So what you've got to do on the stock market is is look for some of the steadier growth stocks. I mean, AGL has been absolutely hammered. But if you are looking towards some stocks to put your money in, I'd stick towards the gambling stocks outside of Crown, who's going through that absolute shitstorm of investigations. But again, you've got some property trusts which provide decent yields. But again, with a 20 to 30% correction over time in the ASX 200 and all ordinaries, at the moment, unless you can know some products to benefit from what's happening, certainly spreading your money across a number of financial, financial institutions is a wise bet. Or you can always look towards the Perth Mint. And you've said that gold and silver aren't always a great investment, Martin, but what they do is provide some protection on purchasing power. So I think it's a quite a confusing period. I'm not expecting anyone to sign up as a client and say, look, let's throw 10 grand at each, each of those five shit companies you recommended. No, I, people need to largely be conservative, but I think sitting on, on money across a number of banks is financial freedom at the moment and just wait for things to correct. And with one of those opening quotes that Morgan Kelly said, and this guy's been around, that the falls of the of the gains will be 70%, but it, it's a lot slower than everyone thinks. Yeah, I agree. And um, I, I, James, I tend to agree with you too, that the banks will probably save a big four institution. That's exactly right. They couldn't allow financial stability risks of, of that failing. That's why I still think that the uh, main banks here are 
pretty okay. Some of the smaller ones, you know, may, maybe less so, some of the regionals, but um, just be a little bit cautious. But um, Tony, we've we've gone way, way over, and I've only gone half through the questions. <laughs> okay. I, I've just yeah, got I've only one... drunk half a bottle. Oh, okay. Well, I've got I've got one last question, which I just touch on because um, yep. that the, there's there's a lot of so so basically the question. This is from um, Philip, from Jane, and a couple of other people too. Right? Um, do you still hold a negative view of on Bitcoin? Bearing in mind, of course, it's gone up. It's yeah. you know hit hit another high recently. Yeah. Well, I I I maintain the view that in any speculative bubble, you're going to have a few survivors. And I've, I actually had a look at crypto prices to date. So what, what happened is in 2016, 2017, the world went absolutely batshit crazy and we saw Bitcoin hit $20,000 and fall all the way to $3,000. So a lot of people would have been stopped out, would have sold out of that speculation and now we're in the mid 50s. We've had Elon Musk recommend it. I mean, who knows what this could go to based on the fact you can't value it on earnings. You can't, it's, it's pretty much FOMO driven. And I had a look through all the cryptos. I see XRP, which was struggling in the low 20s, is now around 46 cents. I actually do have some clients that punt around cryptocurrencies. But for me, it's like betting on red or black. Either it's going to go up or it's going to go down. But what Bitcoin showed is that when it gets smashed, it absolutely gets smashed. You've got regulatory risk. But for me, largely, once you look out of the majors, the rest of it's a Ponzi, screen, a Ponzi scheme driven by money laundering, driven by underworld money, driven by South Korean housewives who have nothing else to do. So if, if people want to trade Bitcoin, it's all done on technicals. You can actually pull up a Bitcoin chart and it'll give you a technical indicator whether or not that's a buy, hold or a sell. But I can just see huge pressure coming in from governments to quell anything that looks, be, looks to be coming more of a, a reserve currency but for me, yes, fair enough. Bitcoin has pretty much increased 13 times in value, but I'd rather buy a small company that increases 13 times in value without having to explain to my clients what the hell went wrong. So yes, you are gonna have some huge winners out of the cryptocurrency bubble, but remember that it, it's like Pinoclean or Domestos, every bubble, cleans away 99.9% .9 of the shit. And if that's the only takeaway you take away from this live event, then uh, great. Oh, very good. Okay, Tony. And um, I think with that, I'd just like to leave people with one more thought tonight, right? In a time of uncertainty, um, debt can become a more significant burden than almost anything else. And the thing that I keep tripping over when I talk to people in my one-on-one -on -one conversations, is that people have not thought through the counterfactual with regard to their ability to service their debt, either because interest rates go up or because they lose their jobs or some other external factor. And so what I would say to people is, whatever else you do with regard to thinking about your portfolio and the structure of your finances, ask yourself hard questions about the amount of debt you've got. I know rates are low at the moment. As Tony said earlier on, they may not actually stay that uh, forever, so that way forever. But actually, debt can really turn nasty. And, you know, unfortunately, I've seen more people taken down ultimately simply by the piles of debt that they own than anything else. So, to me, having a plan to deal with debt is a really critical part of any portfolio planning. Yeah, yeah no, it's, um, it's a sad state of affairs coming, Martin. And I just think we haven't seen really the social Im implications of what, what's about to hit. Uh, you know, I, I, I've i probably done very well on my stocks, but I, I thought, hey, let's get a year ahead on my mortgage. So that's what I've done. I've got no inclination to, to own a bigger house, to own a better car. I just think life's about 
dealing with people who spark joy. I've got my dog, I've got my girlfriend, and I've got access to some great restaurants in Perth. And, you know, my clients send me cases of champagne when we have a winner. So that's what life's all about. And, you know, people on this channel are highly educated people. They appreciate what you do. But, you know, this COVID has just held up the inevitable. And I think that, you know, now's the time to pretty much to sell the farm, just pretty much sell everything, get rid of the emotional attachment, because I just think that's an absolute load of bollocks and do what you can to sandbag your financial future. You don't have to try and hit home runs with bases loaded like I do. I just do that because I like backing the underdog. I like backing winners, small companies that become bigger ones because they will continue to infinity, whereas overpriced houses will not. And some of those charts would suggest that real house prices during some times will not move for 50 years. And when you created a debt bubble and you know, as I said, I'll go back to the beach ball where you're trying to hold it down. Interest rates just want to rise and you cannot stop that. And it's just going to get very ugly very soon. And um, it's a sad it's a sad state of affairs because I know that we've kept the status quo socially. I know we haven't had we've had a few protests, but we haven't seen the the uproar that I think is coming. And it will all start in the US. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm very bearish for the future of Australia in the short term, but people that have a bit of a financial education that watch your channel should have at least the best possible chance, Martin. Well, that's what it's about, Tony. This is about helping people to understand more about what's going on, not necessarily to tell them the right answer, but at least to help frame yeah. the questions that they, sh they should ask. So if we've achieved that, and I've seen some of the good comments tonight uh, from people who basically um, really appreciated your insights, Tony. So I think we've achieved our objective this evening. So I want to say thank you so much for your your time and your insights once again. Always enjoy speaking with you. Always have um, fun on the on, on the conversation too. And as I say, you've filled up your bingo card, so we'll have to do it yep. again <laughs> again soon, Tony. Now, thank you very much. Okay, have a, look forward ha to it. Have a good evening, and we'll obviously put all of your, your contact details and things in the comments below. So I'm going to take I'll your... go easy on that. Um, yeah, I've got far too many clients, and I've got far too many new inquiries. I just like to look after the 230 people who I love dearly. So, yeah, if you want to become a client, send me a sob story. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm full, and how much money is enough? I don't want a Ferrari. I don't have LMS. I'm here to just help people make a decision, and that's it. Yeah, good point there, Tony. And thanks, Jeff, for your contribution. Great to receive. So thank you, Tony. I'm going to take you offline now and then I'll just close off the show. So uh, thank you yep. very much. Talk to you again soon. So there you are. Great, great um, chat with Tony there and uh, very, really important um, uh, suggestions and advice. Um, you know, as we said at the start, this is not financial advice. This is just a general conversation about what's going on. But uh, I think quite a critical conversation. There's some really important messages there tonight. Uh, now, just in terms of next week, just to say that uh, we're going to continue the markets theme. I'll have Damien Klassen on from Nucleus Wealth. And he's going to give us his perspective on the markets. And I've asked him specifically to talk about fundamental value and what's, the, you know, how do you identify fundamental value and what does it mean in the current environment? Is there such thing? So I think that'll be worth uh, uh, catching up with. So that's this time next week, 8 p.m. Sydney time. So mark your diaries. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Uh, meantime, uh, we'll be back with uh, more shows over the next few days. There's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. I've got. Um, some information coming about strata property that'll be up tomorrow i've got a conversation with regard to debanking which will come up over the next couple of days and there's some other stuff too so i want to say thank you very much for spending some time with me this evening and with tony really appreciate all of those comments and all of the discussions and uh, keep um keep the faith with regard to what's going on and um Remember to come back next week and have another conversation. We look forward to seeing you then. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. See you next time.